Hello, my name is Eric Clark. I'm a lecturer in health informatics at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Chanel Watson has asked me to deliver this lecture to you on the subject of informatics in healthcare, or uh, to use another phrase more widely used perhaps is medical informatics. Um, I appreciate the fact that I am addressing a group of postgraduates and therefore um, you will have extensive work experience and applied uh, knowledge in the area of data acquisition. Um, I also appreciate that you will have uh, as a group a varied experience in this regard. Um, so I hope uh, where I use examples that they may be either informative or relevant to you. Um, the term medical informatics or healthcare informatics can be broadly defined as uh, the process where we develop and assess methods and systems for the acquisition, processing and interpretation of patient data uh, with the help of knowledge that is obtained by scientific research. Uh, the three key words in this definition are acquisition, processing and interpretation. And in many ways, this could be uh, applied to the use of a computer. Generally, uh, computers can acquire information that is by typing, scanning uh, from a network. Information is processed by the processor of the computer and then that information is displayed in some form of interpretation of the original acquired data. So, uh, the issue of course with this subject is that it's vast and I've chosen to focus on only three or four areas today so the uh, by necessity the insight might be fairly limited uh, there is also some additional reading in uh, this lecture so you may wish to pursue some of that but before we go there uh, I want to remind the class I'm sure that all have seen these resources in Moodle uh, you may uh, I've noticed that the system has been upgraded, it looks slightly different, it behaves slightly in a slightly different way. But where I would uh, draw your attention to are these two links, the uh, library, which is the website itself, and internally on Moodle, information seeking and library skills. And these pages, uh, particularly the information seeking and library skills page, provide a fantastic insight into informatics in action. Uh, to support your research and there are branches of healthcare informatics which cover just this so I suppose this is an applied example that you're already in the sphere of informatics as you pursue your own academic agenda um, you will be familiar with PubMed and of course this is where uh, a lot of us will start if we are looking to do any research and if we look at this in terms of a database or a collection of information, uh, it's quite some achievement. Um, the uh, It holds 23 million citations at the time of the screen grab been taken. That is a vast amount of information. The, uh, but the critical uh, point is here is that it's indexed correctly, it is categorized correctly, and it is available to search we can look through 23 million documents by just using one letterbox uh, keyword search here, which is uh, a phenomenal achievement. And uh, if we look at what's going on in PubMed, what is collected, it reflects also what's going on on the internet. Uh, we have some uh, insight into uh, scholarly activity of uh, patient use of the internet and there's just one example I have two screen grabs here uh, one from 2003 and one from more recently about two weeks ago or ten days ago and we can see that the amount of articles patient use of internet has gone 16,000 to 18,000 um, an interesting exercise perhaps would be to take that phrase patient use of internet or internet and put it into Google and you'll probably get 23 million. So the applied use of informatics there is really critical for us in that we have people using tools to make sense of a vast amount of information and to make it useful. Um, there 
is a PDF here, uh, the first of the uh, additional reading that you may wish to uh, pursue. Uh, and this uh, discusses health literacy, health information seeking behaviours and internet use among patients attending a private and public clinic in the same geographical area. American Day study uh, published uh, in the summer of last year um, and lo and behold it's no surprise but it's an interesting uh, view uh, obviously with good methodological rigor that uh, it, the, one of the findings it's as healthcare enters the digital age uh, healthcare providers must recognize the importance of face-to-face -face physician patient encounter uh, not what you would call groundbreaking uh, yes, talk to people, look people in the eye. Um, but in this paper, it discusses the uh, use of the medical lexicon and how confused patients are by it. And in some cases, uh, how patients are uh, worried by it uh, and it causes them stress. Uh, and what, what's happening, of course, is that there is more and more information available to people online, uh, but they still have yet to make sense of it. And it is your role as a healthcare provider to help in that process. Um, I've also gone and looked at Twitter, uh, just because everybody else seems to be talking about it. Uh, and you can see here that we have, this is 19, or 2013, this is 2014. Uh, I'm trying to look at the hit right there. Okay, yeah, 65 papers one year ago, and this is uh, almost... Uh, doubled not quite uh, in one year so the new medium is attracting uh, research in itself um, and some people love twitter and some people hate it and the one thing i will say about twitter is it, it's precisely the same as any other medium in the in the debate it stimulates about its utility its effectiveness and indeed other concerns that people may have so although it's a new toy relatively or it is something that people get quite exercised about it is uh, nothing new in terms of a piece of technology we encounter these things so uh, in order to put uh, shape on medical data uh, we need a controlled vocabulary a lexicon and um, this as you are probably aware is the standard for this is the international classification of disease and health related problems um, a detailed description of all disease and injuries and um, its diagnosis and each is giving given a unique code <coughs> excuse me so um, there's a screen grab of the ICD website uh, maintained by the uh, World Health Organization and like a lot of things in informatics we uh, are aware of their existence uh, and we may use them uh, but we use the uh, information just at the point where we need it uh, there is again uh, similar to PubMed a vast amount of information in action here uh, uh, a huge amount of work um, to keep it updated and to keep it relevant um, so the effort in the tool that we use is vast and uh, we like the mobile phone system perhaps we don't really notice the mobile phone system until it stops working so uh, there is a considerable amount of technology going on in the background in the handset that keeps this running similar to the ICD system uh, the bit we can't see is vast so as I say the World Health Organization published this uh, uh, giving us morbidity and mortality uh, statistics uh, that's right that they're used in that context and uh, you will see this in action in the Center for Disease Control in the United States in Department of Health reports here in Ireland. Um, the uh, cutting edge of medical informatics courses where this control vocabulary is used to assist with automated decision support, uh, where we uh, select defined vocabulary which then triggers actions within an intelligent database of some description. The uh, complexity and the uh, it, it, I suppose it's not a very in a very attractive data set in that uh, none of them are uh, because it has to be precise and it as you will know from your clinical practice this digs down into fairly minute details uh, and uh, in a lot of cases 
and definitely the, the public at large would be completely unaware of the, uh, the granularity of this information. So uh, that in some ways was a preamble to the lecture. Uh, to uh, the, the lecture, the learning outcomes here uh, are to understand the development and limitations of the electronic healthcare record, um, to understand the concept of data protection in Ireland, uh, to understand the basic concepts of bioinformatics, uh, to understand how professional identities are influenced by the use of online media and in particular social media. These are the four topics, as I have said a few minutes ago, there, there are many, many other topics that could be uh, included. So, and my rationale here is to look into the clinical, uh, into the notion of um, security, privacy, uh, to look at some of the uh, more high-end, if you like, computational uh, software and hardware-based uh, informatics projects in uh, genetics, and then to conclude on a notion of uh, social media and informatics and its impact on healthcare. So uh, a pretty much roundhouse trip there, but uh, let's uh, get started. The second piece of additional reading that you may wish to pursue is uh, this, the PDF will be in Moodle, four factors driving health sectors to revisit their privacy and security uh, practices. Uh, so there are four listed topics. Uh, I find this kind of thing interesting. Uh, uh, the th first issue I point out is that healthcare record, electronic healthcare record, EHR, uh, there are a few interchangeable phrases in this area, but you quickly get uh, used to them. Uh, so we've had a checkered history with this type of thing. Uh, you will definitely have some stories yourselves of how this does or does not work in your own uh, professional practice. Um, and I think one of the things we all share is uh, certainly an exposure to these systems and possibly, uh, uh, certainly in my experience, the way you the system may dictate to you rather than vice versa. We have to fit with these systems within the boundaries of how they're designed and developed. And in some cases, these systems have developed organically over time. So they may have said, started out as one piece of software or hardware and they end up being something else. And that can be somewhat frustrating to the user. We have this man to thank for the medical record. Uh, and it, well, in any case, he gets a lot of the press about it, uh, William Mayo. And the novel idea at the time was that all physicians kept a single notebook. Uh, th that was pretty much it. Uh, the, the book was kept on the desk or with the physician. It became actually an emblem of them at the time um, was very limited of course but it was never written down before then uh, the, it was you know page one was the patient you saw now page two is the patient you saw next that kind of thing um, the, uh, although uh, there was individual records then developed later on uh, it took almost 30 years for this to happen in the Mayo Clinic uh, there was no agreed criteria it was just whatever what somebody wrote down um, and I suppose almost 11 years later, then people figured out we better come up with a minimal data set for each pair patient uh, before and during the consultation. Uh, very simple stuff. And of course, we're only talking about the uh, the doctor record, the doctor generated record, not the nursing record or any other. Uh, this was very much standalone. Uh, and the any observations made by other staff were recorded by the doctor. So uh, there was no contribution from others. Uh, there is a vast uh, and uh, sometimes waning impetus to get this idea of patient data universally uh, sold around the world. Uh, we know, sorry, we know it's universal and it's vital to good quality healthcare. Uh, but the application uh, of the electronic healthcare record is just simply not uniform. Uh, there is no one single system. Uh, we you, know, you could draw a parallel with Google in that they can provide very simple search engines, but the reason they can do that is they're doing it for money. Uh, that, so that's really what it boils down to. Uh, in Ireland, uh, as you will know, we've had different approaches at different hospitals in the private and public sector. 
indeed in some places uh, departments may be using uh, different systems I know that is less and less but certainly has happened and is still going on uh, certainly there is uh, limited uniformity amongst uh, general practitioners uh, although uh, again lots of work going on in that area uh, our key driver in Ireland of course is the European Union uh, and there is uh, uh, an enormous project ongoing to address that issue but it is exactly the same as local issues uh, the European Union is vast so very difficult to join that all up in the one way uh, the underlying all of this is the rationale that paper is bad and computers are good uh, and I suppose there are merits and demerits to that statement uh, of course the paper is static we uh, the but we can then we can have computer data in multiple locations you, you can leave the paper in the ward you can't move it to the next ward or somebody has to go get it uh, the computer data is instant we can call it up we can uh, look at it uh, paper has a fixed order it's uh, fixed by whoever designed the form or the last person to read it you pick it up and somebody may have put something back in the wrong uh, order or uh, indeed may have lost something so we, we all know that uh, and the attraction of the computer data of course is that it can be compiled in any manner so you know you can look at the radiology or drug therapy whatever it is we can just be selective in its use the computer records don't need to be in one place we don't have to go get them we can fetch them onto a screen uh, but the real essence of it of course is that it has to be easily retrieved and uh, certainly uh, computer systems have been very well designed uh, to be computer systems but have not been very well designed as regards the user uh, and if the barrier uh, if there's access problems the systems quickly loses value uh, we see this in certainly where passwords may be shared what is the point of having a password if it's shared uh, if you can't find the correct information in the one place uh, the system is incomplete and so forth um, the uh, most important thing with that and it's a fundamental issue in all informatics is that we're not just simply reproducing paper we're attempting to do something uh, that has more utility and works and if we go back to the very basics of thinking about William Mayo and that uh, idea of a basic data set or uh, a standard data set before the record is uh, as the record is started if we look at this chap uh, this is Tim Berners-Lee the uh, man credited with inventing the World Wide Web and uh, if you just look at what is in a name the many components of uh, Tim's name as he likes to be called he's just Tim to his friends and his family no doubt but he is Sir Timothy John Lee senior or junior I don't know he has all of these uh, professional accreditations uh, so name is not just name we have uh, subcomponents thereof and that's before we get into any other information around the, the medical history or how to record the treatment or the diagnosis of the treatment so very quickly any uh, structured information becomes quite complex uh, and full of data elements as they're called and we could have for do we record sir in the database I don't know what type of man Tim Berners-Lee is but I've never heard anybody refer to him as sir and that may be at his insistence I don't know but you've got Mr. and Mrs. Miss Infant whatever it may be first name middle name last name uh, the uh, male female uh, <clears throat> and then marital status and on and on it goes and these uh, it would be important uh, that these are entered correctly <clears throat> excuse me uh, and the data is entry is forced uh, would it uh, just putting M or F does that work uh, well it probably does but uh, the if it was just selected from a menu then there will definitely be no errors and also uh, with uh, marital status or whatever it is we have uh, what we like a closed um, data element option uh, so the uh, quickly then we have many bits of information the name as we said could have many elements age uh, maybe age ranges uh, uh, also uh, something like age would have uh, 
rules built into it. Can you enter the patient's name as uh, age as 235 years of age instead of uh, 23 uh, years of age? The system should uh, have rules based around that. Uh, the uh, address, the billing information perhaps, the uh, the uh, local authority information, whatever it may be, this uh, also needs to be structured that the, so the name of the town doesn't get entered into the street address. Uh, just to go back there uh, on the electronic, the terminology involved here, uh, and some of the papers that I've provided uh, for the additional reading, these are the phrases that are used interchangeably: electronic healthcare record, computer-based electronic patient record, hospital information system, computer-based patient record. Yeah, as I say, they, they can be used interchangeably to some level. Just be aware that they're there. On the uh, notion of a hospital information system, uh, we're all acutely aware of them and how complex they are. But the uh, information coming from various sources if indeed it does come from these various sources, they may not be linked. Uh, it's essentially what we're looking at here is all of this information ending up in the database. Uh, the, how it's quite used is another ma matter, but this is not all going in in one computer in one office. It is dynamic, it feeds backwards and forwards. Uh, uh, information will be updated at multiple points, but only by authorized individuals. Uh, the outputs can be varied uh, and again not everybody needs to see all of the outputs so on top of any hospital information there will be hospital uh, information support system there will be uh, a design a system design and a security mechanism the main driver and this is from the uh, ICWA site uh, for the electronic healthcare record is that it enables information about an individual to be brought together and therefore provides the opportunity for healthcare organizations to improve quality of care and patient safety now that is a statement that nobody could really argue with because uh, these are all very positive things uh, the electronic version of a patient's medical history is maintained by the healthcare provider over time and may include all key information relevant to that person's care okay that's a fairly straightforward statement uh, we the I think the kicker in there is all of the key information is that always the case this is it's less in uh, aspirational this statement is less in aspirational than that one and then we get into may include a range of data in comprehensive or summary form including and on and on it goes so the main aspiration I suppose and then we get down to uh, the, uh, what, what I suppose is a looser uh, definition of what's going on uh, and as I've said in practice uh, we end up with something that approximates to this it's not necessarily the reality the history to date with electronic healthcare records uh, has been littered with issues uh, fistfights, tears, uh, money you name it uh, has gone into this um, the we're 30 years down the road in the European Union uh, in this project uh, and the initial focus was collecting data to uh, get some idea of what was going on and as the data was assessed uh, it became clear that this is uh, a more complex issue the costs are absolutely vast They're, this cannot be understated and I have an example of that in a minute from the NHS in the UK. Uh, ideally, we should be at a situation where we can talk to computers and it can pick up our speech. Uh, and of course, we see this in TV all the time, but uh, uh, that's not how it works. And indeed, that's not how uh, the, the world works. And maybe uh, free speech uh, or impressionistic speech it doesn't have much of a place in the healthcare record and we need to be very careful um, the <clears throat> excuse me patients though when we talk about electronic healthcare records uh, invariably we end up at issues about privacy and security uh, the, it doesn't take very long for any conversation in this area to focus in on these issues uh, 
this in itself is very important, but it needs to be put in perspective about privacy and security in general. Uh, and those of you who uh, have worked on wards and, and will know that uh, in some cases it might be as easy or easier for someone to pick up a chart and just walk away with it. Uh, hacking into a computer is uh, rare, uh, to, to be blunt. Uh, it, it doesn't happen as much as we may think. <clears throat> but the uh, main issue now for uh, patients is that somebody may be listening full time. And I think what we've seen in the last two years with uh, security and privacy uh, issues is the wholesale uh, mass surveillance uh, issues that rightly concern uh, uh, members of the public and that in itself is a matter for another time. Uh, the costs as I said this example here is the national apologies there I had to stop the recording get a glass of water. Uh, the issue of cost here is a fantastic example uh, taken from the Guardian late last year. Uh, with one, two things in this title abandoned and ten billion pounds sterling. Uh, the it, it, it's a fantastic uh, story if you care to dig in. You may know something of it, but it is billed as the uh, biggest IT failure ever seen uh, globally. Uh, and huge project uh, to link GPs and hospitals and have an electronic healthcare record and it, it never happened and the money was wasted. The uh, other issue uh, around informatics and it is a huge issue as you will know in healthcare is error and uh, the uh, here's an article uh, admittedly some time ago but this is part of uh, how we actually trust computers uh, and we, we all this uh, if you're ordering something online do you for uh, do you think that maybe is my credit card information safe um, I know that's a, a matter of hacking but when we interact with computers uh, you know you're, you're checking to see that the things are correct uh, the there is a certain uh, worry amongst patients uh, and the public at large uh, about how computers can introduce error. And it's uh, a strange thing in that uh, computers should uh, provide better structured de de entry of data. Uh, so we are in a, a fluid situation whereby there are positive and negative influences. Uh, and this can only really be uh, assessed on some kind of continuous audit. Installing something and letting it run, uh, oh, the tendency is when the, the system is installed that it's deemed, it's deemed a success. Uh, and realistically, uh, all of these systems, whatever they may be, uh, need to be continually assessed and uh, to uh, listen to feedback to see if everything is running correctly. So if we go and think of ourselves individually in the landscape of data, in the morass of data that's out there, think about how many databases that you're on right now. Uh, stop the video perhaps, make a list. Think about that. How many can you list? Utility companies, whatever it may be. Uh, the number is, well, it might surprise you. So turn off there, have a go. Uh, I'll proceed now anyway. And here's my list. And uh, I'm just, as I'm recording this, uh, I see on my phone here, right beside me, uh, from RTE News, uh, Irish Water to issue the first bills uh, at the end of January as the Commission extends validation campaign until the end of November. So uh, I know that's not good news for any of us in a way. We're all going to have to pay this. Uh, it looks that way. 
but there was a system we were told was going to work. Uh, the con controversy has slowed it down. Uh, they want our RSI number, which people aren't happy about. Uh, that database there uh, knows maybe just as much as the tax office does now. Uh, and we're getting to a situation, uh, rightly so, I feel that uh, we should all be concerned about it as it's information. But that, again, another day's work there, perhaps. So look what I found. Irish Water, uh, ESB, yes, uh, Board Gosh, yes, Aircom, Vodafone, yes, uh, UPC, uh, the TV license had me, uh, so that would be Aircom, it would be in there with the internet service provider, credit cards, loyalty cards, Dunn stores will know what I bought, when I buy it, they'll send me targeted emails or targeted uh, junk mail, Amazon do exactly the same. Uh, I'm creating a profile for myself online using these services. We'll get back to that later on in the lecture. But these will also have uh, profiling information. Uh, and on and on we go. Uh, and even down to the fact if you've travelled or you applied for a visa somewhere. Certainly if you've been to the United States in the last few years, the uh, extent of the ESTA numbers uh, these obviously the Americans have a very tight control on their border. So, uh, how many did I count? I think it was 24. Uh, the thing to reflect on perhaps would be what if all this information was shared? How scary would that be? There would be absolutely nowhere to hide uh, if one person had control or could use it for nefarious means. Uh, so there's a lot of information about us out there. Uh, we have some or little control of it. Uh, our control and our protection comes via data protection. Um, and although I appreciate I'm giving this lecture to postgraduate group in Dublin, uh, the we should be also aware that data protection laws are different across the world. Similar but different. Uh, we're really at a... a Irish and European uh, level here. Uh, European law informs Irish law in this context, as it does most others. But uh, the data protection uh, really was something that was imposed upon us by uh, European law. Uh, imposed, perhaps, is the wrong word to use, but it, it, it came from European law. And it is based on uh, ethical ethics, really, uh, ethical behaviour set. Um, the uh, data protection commissioner himself uh, is a busy man uh, and uh, although there's, it's quite a small office uh, they handle many many issues they because Facebook and uh, Google have their European headquarters here the data protection commissioner is under considerable pressure uh, uh, in terms of the amount of work they do and they still have to handle uh, complaints or issues that throw up in individuals daily lives uh, the uh, biggest issue uh, for patients in the healthcare informatics setting is the uh, data theft and security, as I've said. And this is a very telling report, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper uh, surveying six hundred uh, American data now, six hundred uh, people allied with uh, uh, the healthcare profession, and. Uh, they found that the healthcare organisations are slipping behind. Uh, now again, I'm probably uh, watered down language, perhaps not too provocative, uh, but the uh, issue is this data sharing. Uh, the, because we're highly networked, uh, the systems, when they were just within the hospital and didn't speak to anything else, were easier to manage. And uh, now, of course, with the multitude of networks and uh, Wi Fi and uh, external data sources, uh, this is uh, much more difficult. Uh, there's also tell there of mobile computing and social networking, which we'll get to in a minute again, but uh, the fact that this is now pretty much pervasive. So one third of uh, hospitals in this group uh, reported uh, medical identity theft. Now, uh, that, that's quite a shocking number. I also wonder uh, what is the what are the unreported uh, numbers. Uh, 
and 54% of the organisation reported at least one issue with information privacy. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, that these are it, that's one third theft. Half of the organisations have issues with privacy. So this is going on. It is very real and very problematic. Um, error protection there as um, both users and in the healthcare profession, uh, the, we generate this data. Uh, so the Pro Data Protection Commissioner sees this as an evolving relationship. Uh, and I think that's the only way it can be. Uh, the, the legal right and the public expectation of privacy in the collection and sharing of data. Uh, so the I suppose critically here that there's a lot of anonymous data, but you know, people's healthcare information is probably their most private data, one certainly one that people will be most concerned about. Uh, and again, the Irish Data Protection uh, Office, uh, the uh, improper or uh, use or disclosure of uh, information can be the root cause, uh, and that's what we we saw that recently with the credit unions. Uh, Private investigators were uh, going into credit unions and essentially charming information out of the uh, the staff. It was uh, social engineering to to a degree, and uh, this is uh, data protection is not an issue per se with uh, uh, just computers. The, the you know we're looking at your data is in a hospital. It's the if that data is given away. So. Uh, although we tend to think of that as just a computer issue, it's a physical or social issue as well. Uh, again, from the Data Protection Commissioner's website, the uh, where it most uh, you can see this, obviously, uh, if you were to map it into your own life, yes, health information or criminal justice information, financial, then, of course, genetic profiling, if that were to uh, tap me more and more, if it were to put, say, into insurers' hands or whatever it might be, where people are, and then, of course, uh, small things, eth uh, ethnic information, gender, whatever it is, it's private and it should remain so. Uh, the issue, of course, about confidentiality is uh, you know, central to our professional lives. Uh, and it is uh, the, the dynamic here with computer systems is that uh, we're looking at an agreement between the medical staff and the IT staff. So there's another dynamic here, uh, the, I suppose similarly to the medical records staff, if you like, when uh, medical records are stuffed into one room or uh, one building. Uh, and in my own memory, uh, the medical records department were staffed by uh, very uh, studious and uh, uh, professionally competent people. Uh, there was no way that uh, records were being given out just to anybody there was system set up uh, and that's the important thing is that the confidentiality of these systems should be as good as any manual system uh, we need to look at uh, uh, there were people involved there was people checking things uh, when they were in rooms and this is just as important now that an example of this confidentiality issue and this was highly publicized at the time you will remember the extremely lucky Dolores McNamara, who won 115 million euros some years ago now. Uh, well, uh, Dolores, uh, it was reported at the time, uh, she her social welfare records, uh, uh, it was alleged that uh, Miss McNamara had committed social welfare fraud, uh, and this came out in the papers. So immediately, uh, you know, where, where did this information come from? Uh, whatever the case, uh, anybody's social welfare record is private and not open to uh, comment in the media. Uh, this was investigated. Uh, and the Department of uh, Social Welfare looked at the computer logs in uh, on their system. Uh, it showed that at least 72 individuals in the department had looked at this lady's uh, welfare records in the days just after her win. So by virtue, I suppose, instant uh, fame here for Dolores uh, when she won the money, uh, people in the Department of Social Welfare then, oh, I'm going to look at her record and uh, 
they had no right to do so. They should not be looking at the information and certainly should not have been passed it on. Um, the sanction or the action was a reprimand and uh, the uh, you will remember the uh, it stimulated a debate with the uh, confidentiality of computer of the information stored by the government. <coughs> but I am sure that the system is uh, of the highest standard. This uh, were 72 curious individuals who probably have access to the system for a multitude of reasons. Um, it may be the case they just, Dolores McNamara wasn't in their area. I, I don't understand. Or did, I, the actual details weren't published. But the fact is that this confidential information was browsed and then actioned and published in a newspaper, which of course is uh, not on. There's a, uh, you will be familiar with the TED Talks, uh, absolutely fantastic stuff. Uh, the this chap here, uh, John Wilbanks, uh, it, 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 it's I think it's about a fifteen minute video. It's well worth watching. Uh, you can copy out the URL from the file uh, when you download it. Um, when you're getting medical treatment, he says, or taking part in medical testing, privacy import is important, absolutely. Uh, but what if your data could be used anonymously? by anybody seeking to test a hypothesis. And this is uh, a very simple, but a very powerful idea. Uh, and what Mr. Wilbanks is uh, theorizing is, that while we really want our information to be private, it may actually be hampering research. So we may need to look at uh, allowing anonymous data uh, out into the wider world for analysis a difficult concept uh, to action considering the amount of uh, concern there is and uh, particularly as i've commented much earlier on uh, but uh, the notion of mass mass surveillance which of which there are examples of um, the idea around security of information and i've just got one slide on this because it is uh, it's quite a heavy subject and can go on for quite some time but what we're looking at the really four things we need to maintain the confidentiality of the data that's a given but it needs to be available uh, and by that it means we need to be able to work with it uh, you know the most secure computer is the one that's turned off and uh, locked into a, a concrete bunker that's a very secure computer but it's not available so we have a compromise here making information available and keeping it confidential the integrity of the information um, also uh, reflects its security uh, if the data isn't good uh, if we can't check that the data is correct uh, the data could become compromised or useless or in some cases dangerous to the patient and like the 72 civil servants uh, the there's a degree of accountability who put the information in when uh, or who looked at it and when or who changed it and when and that accountability uh, links right back to the start of that at confidentiality so uh, our third area for discussion in this lecture would be around bioinformatics um, bioinformatics is the application of computer science and information technology to the field of biology and medicine uh, a vast subject area uh, and quite exciting in, in many ways because the uh, rate of change and the, the rate of discovery is frantic to say the least uh, use of information systems to analyze large biological data sets so uh, this is information taken for example uh, from DNA or protein sequences uh, which are sequenced automatically um, the goals within bioinformatics are to uncover this wealth of biological information hidden in massive amounts of data. Uh, there is more um, information in a drop of water, uh, they say, than all the computers in the world, how it sits together, the molecules, the makeup. The, if you were trying to record everything that's going on in a drop of water, uh, it's virtually impossible. So think of that at a cellular level or a genetic level. Um, and this is having a profound impact on what we do 
the uh, the uh, gene sequencing, gene therapy, all that kind of thing, uh, drug development uh, is moving rapidly because of these advances, uh, advances that certainly wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. Uh, some common examples of what's going on are applications of it, mapping and analysis of the DNA, as I said, protein sequences, sequences aligning different DNA and protein sequences to compare them, and creating and viewing 3D models. Uh, these uh, models are, exist virtually. Uh, they, uh, we can look at and uh, predict uh, properties uh, of a 3D structure to some degree. So there's uh, uh, things are done uh, mocked up virtually before, uh, uh, say, if you like, lab testing begins or uh, that kind of thing. Um, the most famous of these uh, is the. Uh, human genome project uh, the if you are of a mind type that into uh, YouTube and there is two videos public and private only a couple of minutes each will explain to you what was done uh, it's uh, quite an undertaking uh, and uh, a, a ground shift in modern medicine I think probably will be noted as one of the major achievements in the last 50 years um, why this is important uh, is uh, we're making sense of this data. Uh, we, although we can collect the data, as that's the acquisition part early on in the definition of medical informatics, we then have to process and make some sense out of it and interpret it. Uh, we need to, uh, because this is com entirely and completely computer dependent, we're now really at the cutting edge of data manipulation, storage, and analysis uh, with. Uh, massive implications for uh, processing speed and data uh, transmission across networks uh, another video i would recommend in this area uh, is this chap richard resnick uh, a ted video uh, just ted.com if you're wondering where that is uh, and there he is just type in welcome to the genomic uh, revolution really fantastic stuff uh, as he predicts and gives a very very good uh, overview uh, like all TED Talks very succinct and uh, uh, with good impact. Uh, to draw this back then to the actual informatics in action the uh, all of uh, information here around gene sequencing chromosome maps that kind of thing are hosted at the National Library of Medicine Entree the life sciences search engine and you'll find that close there's PubMed, you'll know PubMed, it's in there somewhere. Um, what we have is genes, uh, uh, chromosome maps, as I said, uh, related structures, references, on and on it goes. Massive, massive amounts of information uh, publicly available. And uh, that's another uh, aspect of informatics is that the American government, and indeed it is Al Gore who uh, takes credit here, uh, looked at all this information which was being produced by uh, federal dollar research or research funded by federal dollars and uh, the, it made little sense they thought to keep this locked away and uh, legally it belonged to the public anyway because they were funding it from their tax dollars so this is why this PubMed and everything else is available openly. Um, okay the final stretch here now uh, thank you for bearing with me if you have uh, we want to look at uh, Thinking about cyberspace, so we're just looking at how you're projected it onto the internet and how about your online identity. So you could legitimately say, what does this have to do with health informatics? Well, six years ago, people would say, I don't know, because this was not really so much of a problem. Uh, we were getting used to these type of things. Now we're in a situation that we are surrounded by uh, cyberspace, we're surrounded by uh, mobile phones, social media, all that kind of thing. So it does have an impact on us uh, as healthcare professionals. Uh, these are questions that I ask our undergraduate students. Uh, I, you, you obviously uh, will have a different profile, but you know, do you tweet? Well, uh, invariably, uh, we're looking maybe about eighty or ninety percent of the students would be tweeting. Uh, interestingly, less and less of our new undergraduate students are using Facebook. The comment is from a young student. Uh, I asked the class, uh, 
who's using Facebook, only a few hands, and somebody didn't put up their hand. I said, why don't you use Facebook? And he stood up and he said, it's for old people like you, which that put me in my place. And the research shows that's exactly what's happening. The younger children, uh, younger adults, uh, are not interested in it, don't want to hang around with their parents, if you like, don't want to like them in Facebook, so they've gone elsewhere. Uh, the issue, of course, with email is that you probably have an RCSI email account, you may have one for work, you may have one privately. Uh, the you know How do we check all of these things? Well, the spam is very annoying. Uh, people send emails and you're not quite sure if they're asking you a question, making a statement or just venting steam. Uh, it is, it's a messaging system, but if it, for work it's very difficult. We get too many of them. I think there is a value judgment in there. Uh, do you have a YouTube account? Do you upload video? Uh, you, we, I'd say about 20, 30% of the students would be uploading video, mostly related to gaming. They'd be recording what they're doing. A few students are uh, budding chefs. They, one or two guys have a, a cooking channel, which is fantastic. But you know, uh, where you're in here somewhere, uh, quite where you are is, uh, oh, it's going to be different for each individual. It's certainly different for a 17 year old undergrad or 18 year old undergrad uh, than it would be for me. Uh, I'm much, much older than that. So, uh, but the thing is, we're all in here somewhere. Uh, so, while we're in that space, the questions we can ask ourselves is, uh, what do you say about yourself online? What do you post or why do you post it? Um, and I think there is a needs to be an internal um, regulation in our own minds about how we project ourselves. My experiences here, as I say, are dealing with undergraduate students, but I'm also a parent uh, of some two teenage children um, and of course their faces are glued to the device uh, i have to talk to them well, no, i don't have to talk to them on a regular basis i do talk to them on a regular basis about this uh, and really what i'm concerned about is that they uh, know who they're talking to which you know that, that i suppose that that's a judgment in itself um, but also how they portray themselves online uh, being decent, being nice, being proper, uh, you know, don't, don't be insulting or don't uh, project an image of yourself that can be uh, interpreted in some way. Uh, and essentially, of course, that happen, matters because uh, somebody will look them up. And I think from our own point of view, our patients may look us up uh, if uh, you if they're of a mind to. And certainly we know that that's where people go. But sometimes medically they go to the internet first, but they're going to go back to the internet. <clears throat> what I find interesting about this space is that uh, we were all told at one stage that we would all be creating content. Everybody will be editing Wikipedia pages and uploading video, and we'd all have websites and uh, we'd be writing blogs. And the reality is actually very, very different. Um, we're really... Uh, consumers of information and this is reflected in these next two slides if we look there from wikipedia articles pretty much going in a very healthy curve uh, running on to 30 million almost 30 million individual wikipedia articles that's quite an amount of information um, the thought of wikipedia uh, can uh, have people run screaming from the room in that it's not reliable well that is not my experience. Uh, Wikipedia is extremely useful, but it's uh, in some ways like looking at the window at the weather. It gives you a very good starting point, but if you really want to know how cold it is or how windy it is, you have to go outside. So you have to take a further step into the information to find out. And that's very much in the realms of the librarians where I'm sure on your own, you'll know that from searching. But so the, the curve is going up here. Um, lots of articles but look at this this is what i find interesting is active Wiki, wikimedia wikipedia uh, editors wikimedia is a uh, umbrella term for there's more than just one wikipedia site there are people uploading video and audio and that kind of thing and pictures so uh, so these are people who do five or more edits per month uh, which is you know that's that they, I suppose they could be sitting there for hours and that would be one edit, but uh, given that there are 30 million pages, 
we only have in and around 78, 77,000 editors. Uh, that is stark for me in that this that one of the most popular websites on the planet, uh, hundreds of millions of views per month, is being maintained by uh, 70,000 people. Uh, still, the numbers are big, but uh, we're not contributing as was promised, or this was the allure. And very quickly, what we did, we became consumers rather than um, uh, editors or creators. Uh, we don't actively produce anything online as such, uh, but we do post a lot of messages and comments and pictures and whatever it is. We're involved in that space. Now, those of you listening to this who are not in social media and have no intention to do so, you are still creating a lot of emails, perhaps. You are creating a, um, a trail of websites you visit. You're creating something, but it's not content. That's the important thing. Uh, it's not content in the classical sense of a paper or a, an essay or uh, an article that somebody is likely to identify you with. Uh, but we are producing this which is content nonetheless i know that sounds uh, contrary in some ways but uh, we have a presence based on the content or the trail we leave on the internet and this is uh, the is summed up in the uh, literature uh, in terms of through the lens of uh, professional identities as students uh, and this it could just as easily be staff or, or whatever in, in the in the notion that you are as an individual uh, you're also defined to some degree or identified with your uh, institution uh, be it this one be it the royal college of surgeons or the hospital or healthcare environment you work in you do have uh, multiple professional identities in that regard which then goes up to uh, everywhere indeed your community and everything else but it is you in the middle projecting outwards into these spaces and we have uh, the blurring of per personal and professional identity via social media uh, the rules uh, are slightly warped now it was a time you'd walk out of the hospital or the college and when you left you left the, the, there was no connection to you or it uh, you weren't about to uh, post something online uh, of course, your identity carried around with you socially, but now the fact that we're online and connected, people can look you up. They can see, oh, that's uh, Eric Clark. He works in the Royal College of Surgeons. There's his Facebook page or his blog or wherever it might be. Um, and the fact you could, that can be linked to you. Uh, the ex expressions that people make via social media uh, are quick and easy and may not be considered at the time. And I think we all have examples of that. Uh, that we could replay in our heads it's uh, you know a, a quick reaction is not necessarily the right one uh, this online activity produces evidence and that, that is really the strong word there and this evidence can be searched <coughs> excuse me um, and of course patients will google your name uh, the, the, this happens it happens all the time I've said before it's it's vital this is where people will go or indeed have we, as we've seen <coughs> excuse me um, as we've seen uh, the uh, there are websites where institutions are ranked and uh, quite how that ranking is derived is another issue but this is all online all easily uh, accessible and of course we know uh, that job, job applications will uh, research people online applicants will be researched uh, quick easy uh, straightforward thing to do people spend a lot of time cultivating their LinkedIn profile uh, of course the some can be a work of fiction but it's all part of the mosaic of trying to get a handle on people uh, and certainly what we're finding with the undergraduates the younger students is that we're looking at them trying to develop their personal identity and their professional identity uh, two extreme pictures here but because they're washing around with uh, the students have always been told not to discuss 
patient data uh, publicly, not to discuss what happens, for example, in the dissecting room or you know, to respect what's going on there. Uh, and uh, this has been a tenant of our lives forever. This is important. But particularly in the social media space, uh, the we're asking students to consider themselves uh, and their professional identity. That's not to say that they shouldn't have a personal identity online because it, there is absolutely no harm in this. Please don't get me wrong. I am not uh, a naysayer when it comes to social media. It is a very powerful and useful tool and certainly patient advocacy groups use it quite well. There are other very healthy examples uh, out there. <clears throat> This PDF is um, also on Moodle. Oh, I'm sorry, I had to pause again to get some more water. I do apologize, I'm not having a good day here. Um, the uh, PDF is in Moodle, uh, Privacy, Professionalism and Facebook, A Dilemma for Young Doctors. And I just think it's an, it, it's an interesting read uh, because it, they've surveyed uh, doctors and asked them, uh, okay, what's going on here? Now, it's a little while ago, but the uh, doctors are active members of Facebook, fair enough, as uh, so that's falling down a bit. That could be Twitter, it could be Instagram, could be Snapchat. You put any word in there, and indeed in three years' time, there could be a completely new word there that we don't know anything about, but it's the same issue repeated. Uh, a quarter of these doctors did not use the privacy options. Now, I'm still not sure what the privacy options are on Facebook because they change quite frequently, uh, and it's very difficult to keep a handle on them. Uh, but what this shows is that uh, a quarter of these people weren't even bothered to look it up to uh, assure themselves of what was going on. And that's quite a big number, 25%. Uh, they weren't sure what was being broadcast about them. Uh, deeper into the paper, the information was revealed that might have caused distress to patients, uh, alter professional boundaries, or could have called them into disrepute. And that is... I suppose where uh, the professionalism and social media collide very badly. Uh, is it okay to post a picture at a social event or doing something and that becomes associated with the healthcare professional? Uh, and it, it, it seems like an awful lot of common sense, but uh, as I said, there are more and more opportunities for this to happen. Uh, and as I say, we're looking at this social me and professional me. Between those somewhere, the truth or the uh, the the reality exists uh, and i'm just putting this on screen to remind you uh, uh the, these types of agreements pop up all the time and you will have signed something similar to this uh when you joined the college this is our agreement and what do we do we go oh yeah just press yes just give me what i need we do it with ryanair all the time Aer lingus we buy concert tickets we buy a a sofa, anything, I just sign here, and that's what we do. Um, and we're bound by these rules, and the college's rules are no different to anybody else's. There's nothing in there that would surprise you. But we are entering into contracts with uh, online services like this, and uh, we need to be absolutely sure that our data won't be shared, and we want to know how this is kept and how it's curated. And also, what are the expectations within the system? The IMO have produced a position paper on social media. Uh, you, it's fairly brief. It, uh, there's some, some instruction on uh, some recommendations. They're here. The, the GMC uh, have uh, the, uh, the these are more guidelines. So the IMO is just a little bit. It's a position paper. GMC call them guidelines, whatever, so you get the idea. Um, it says, look, uh, you must treat colleagues fairly and with respect. You know, the, do we need to be told that? Uh, there, we look at communicating, speaking, writing in the media. You must maintain patient confidence. These are all, as I've said previously, basic information. Uh, they applied to new technologies uh, as a a colleague said recently to me, uh, it's the same stuff, we just have new and different toys to do it with. So I would mirror that. Um, so from the IMO document, uh, 
they recommend and if this isn't an order it isn't part of your professional practice or uh, it isn't the, the i don't know what the i'm sure the ino, INO have uh, something similar like avoid adding and accepting your patients and their relatives into social networks and the minute i said this to undergraduates a hand went up in the lecture theory and i said what if one of your patients is a uh, a friend or a relative <coughs> or their relative I, I don't have an answer to that bluntly um and these are uh advice maybe i'd give to my children in some ways you know uh, but avoid posting content regarding patients this is goes back to ethics 101 when you started your training uh but it does happen people are po taking pictures in wards and it's crazy behavior for, for in my opinion uh the you know we can't identify pain we know all these things uh, th these have been going on before uh the in, the social media came along but what a lot of commentators are calling this is a a moral panic to a degree in that oh there's something badly wrong we need to do something about it uh we have this new scary threat we need to i agree it is new i'm not so sure about the extent of the threat because it is to some degree uh new new clothes on an old horse as it were uh so on that cautionary note i suppose and i i, I would I, again i'm not trying to instill any uh panic or uh, any uh, fear into people i think we just need to be careful how we operate but again we're applying standards of practice that are close to us uh, and uh, brought to us since the starting of our training uh, thank you very much i hope you found that somewhat informative uh, as I said, there are PDFs in Moodle, and if you have any further questions, uh, you can post a notice in the discussion forum on the page in Moodle.